stars are brightly shining It is the night of our dear Savior's birth Long lay the world in sin and error pining Till he appeared and the soul felt its worth A thrill Pastor Joel here. The church is, is quiet. The world is quiet. Christmas is over. And I, I sure hope that you had a good Christmas. And so as we prepare for, for worship here, just one day separated from Christmas, the service that you're about to hear was actually recorded last Sunday, uh, just before Christmas, in anticipation of his coming. Uh, that said, it's not out of date. It's not obsolete. And we hope that you'll be blessed by the word proclaimed, the gospel proclaimed, for the, the good news of Christmas is good every day and, and is a spirit that we need to continue to carry throughout the year with us. Um, and also, we, we, one more quick invite as we wrap this year up, I hope that as we begin a new year next year, if you've been joining us online, that you would transition and, and maybe 
pray about joining us in person. For what we are doing here, this, this online broadcast is in no way intended to serve as a replacement for actually being involved with a local church. For it is so important to be plugged into a local body of believers, the body of that incarnate Christ on earth. And we hope, we pray that maybe we can be that church for you. So would you, would you pray about joining us in person next week as we begin a new year together on the right foot in the Lord's house? That said, I hope that you'll be blessed by the word proclaimed, and I sure hope you had a Merry Christmas. And we are glad that you have joined us this morning, even if it is virtually. We're thankful to have you with us. And again, I hope you had a very Merry Christmas and wish you a Happy New Year. God bless. Luke chapter 1, verses 26 to 38. Luke 1, 26 to 38. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man named Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. But she was deeply troubled by this statement, wondering what kind of greeting this could be. Then the angel told her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Now listen, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Mary asked the angel, How can this be, since I have not had sexual relations with a man? The angel replied to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. And consider your relative Elizabeth. Even she has conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month for her who was called childless. For nothing will be impossible with God. I am the Lord's servant, said Mary. May it be done to me according to your word. Then the angel left her. Let's go to the Lord in one more word of prayer. Fathers, we prepare to expound on your text this morning. I pray for your, as Brother Ellis asked, for your spirit to be upon this place. Father, for it to, it, for it to indwell hearts and to incarnate Christ in our midst. Reminding us that we, we preach the gospel of an incarnate Christ. We preach the word of a living God who came to dwell among man. Who came into this earth to save sinners. And so Father, I pray that you would just melt away the many distractions and be our focus this morning. Hide me behind your cross. Help the words that I bring be not my own, but yours delivered through me. Oh God, I ask that I be merely a mouthpiece for you, for, for we don't need Joel's opinions, but we need the gospel. We need the word of God. So God, I ask you to bring it to bear on us this morning, thanking you for that gift of your grace, that gift of life. And we ask this in your holy name. Amen. I want to try to turn this back on. Is it safe? Okay, we can turn the mic back up. You've got the monitors off. I think that's what was causing the problem. Can you hear me okay? Awesome. We'll give it a try. Thank you guys for being quick on your feet. Appreciate it. So my very first sermon I ever preached here was two years ago. Happy two years, church. Right? Happy two years. It was December 15th, 2019. I shared an old Paul Harvey story about a family on Christmas Eve. Now, since it's been two years, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to share it again. Uh, plus, we've added several new faces since then, so, so it'll be new to, to many of you. Radio personality Paul Harvey loved to tell a certain story about a family on Christmas Eve. This family had a tradition where the mother and children would go to the Christmas Eve service at church, and the father would stay home and read the paper. It was a family tradition. They would go, the father would stay home and read the paper. 
He just couldn't believe all the childhood stories anymore of God coming as a baby in the manger. It just wasn't his thing, you know. So per tradition, as another Christmas Eve rolled around and the family left for church, he opened up the evening paper and settled in to read by the fireplace, looking forward to a couple hours of peace and quiet. But suddenly he heard a tapping on the window. Now what could that be? Right? It was freezing cold outside, Christmas Eve, not much going on. It was snowing. You know, Paul Harvey was an Oklahoman, and we Midwesterners know that every good Christmas story involves snow. Sorry to break that to you Georgians. <laughs> but it does. So anyway, a bird was flying against the, the pane of the window trying to get out of the cold snowstorm, the cold Oklahoma snowstorm, into the warmth of his house. The man had compassion on the bird, so he slipped into his coat and he went outside to try to bring it in. As he approached the bird, it got scared and it flew against the window even harder, trying to get away. Pretty soon, the bird had managed to knock itself silly. If you've ever watched a bird fly into a window, that, that happens. And it fell into the bushes below, half frozen, too weak to do anything, and yet too afraid to be caught by this huge man trying to catch the bird to bring it inside. The more the man tried to catch the bird, the more the bird used what energy it had left to try to hide in the bushes. It was a pretty futile effort. And after a few minutes of this charade, the man yelled out in frustration, Stupid bird, can't you understand I'm trying to help? The man paused and thought, If you only understood, you wouldn't fly away. If only, if only I could become a bird and get you to understand. I'd have you follow me inside where it's safe and warm. If only I could become a bird, I'd save you. Just then, the church bells rang as they did on every Christmas Eve. But when the man heard the bells this time, he didn't scoff. He fell to his knees and began to cry, saying, Oh God, oh God, I didn't understand. I didn't understand. John Run 1 reads, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through Him, and apart from Him, not one thing was created that has been created. Verse 14, then the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So in this story, which is no Paul Harvey story, it's, it's reality. God did become the creature so that he could dwell with the creatures, weep with the creatures, suffer with the people, talk with the people, speak the people's language, die for the people, raise again for the people, all so that he could save the people by bringing them back into the warmth of the house from which we had flown, so that we may dwell in the safety and warmth of the house with the Father forever. So maybe you don't understand that. This morning, maybe we're like the father, and, and we, or we, maybe we just take it for granted, right? We, we grew up in church, we've heard this our whole life, since we were in diapers at Bible school, and this is not exciting to us. This is routine, we've heard it our whole life. If so, my aim for this morning is to walk through our text. We won't have time to walk through every nuance, but just enough, so we can see just how the God of the universe broke into creation and saved it. By becoming a man. The first verse of our text, Luke 1.26 reads, In the sixth month, that is the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy with John the Baptist, the angel Gabriel was sent from God. Now this is the first and most fundamental fact about the incarnation. It starts with God. It comes from God. God. The angel was sent from God, by God, right? Christmas has no meaning apart from this, right? It's not about gifts. It's about this. Christmas is about the creator of the universe who is himself not a part of the universe, becoming a part of the universe to save the universe. So from where did he come from? If it came from God, that meant he wasn't from a part of the universe originally. So where did he come from? Where did this angel come from? Where did God come from? Let's start there. Let's start there. Well, we know God is separate from time and space. 
For those of you who come to our systematic theologies on Sunday night, we've had a lot of conversation about that. Right? To God, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. 2 Peter 3.8 God doesn't operate on the same level as you and I. Because everything about our universe, from the time to the molecular to the macro, right? everything has been created. Right? And God is the uncreated one. Right? No one created God. Right? God exists separate from time, separate from space, separate from the physical, separate from the spiritual, separate from anything the human mind could ever fathom. Right? We can't wrap our minds around this. So whenever we push back on atheists, and maybe some of us have had this conversation before, and we ask, okay, your Big Bang Theory, well, who created the matter and who created the energy that caused it? Right? That's a common argument we'll use, right? We'll go, okay, big, okay, I'll get behind it, but where did the energy that caused the Big Bang come from? And that's what we ask, right? Even the Big Bang didn't come from nothing. Oftentimes, they'll concede, they don't know, but then they'll remind us, well, you Christians have to wrestle with the same question. You claim the energy that caused the Big Bang came from God. But then who created God? Right? That's what they'll ask you. Who created God? Where did your God who created the energy come from? Well, how do you answer them? You tell them nowhere. God came from nowhere. That's what you tell them. And if that seems like a cheat answer, stay with me. Look at this. God created time. Right? God created time. There's no creation. There can be no time. Right? For God to have come from somewhere, or to have been created, or for God to have had a starting point, assumes that time already existed. And this is incorrect. Right? God has no starting point. There never was a time when God was not, because God literally precedes Time. God created the concept of time. Right? He wrote. And if there is no concept of linear time before creation, then there can never be a time when something outside of creation was created because that would imply that there was a starting point. Right? A time when something was and a time when it wasn't. And such things must occur on a timeline. But this is not possible if there is no time. This is getting kind of hard to follow. This is getting deep. But you boil it down and say, right, God created time, church. Time did not exist until God spoke creation into being, and then time began. But everything outside of that creation, which is God and only God, does not go by time. God is who He is. Right? He just is. Exodus 3.14 God answers Moses' question on the matter by saying simply, I am who I am. Right? Separate from space, he's separate from time, he's separate from everything that is creation. Right? That's how you answer that question. God isn't created, time is created by God. Therefore, apart from time playing a factor, there's no need to ask the question, from where did he come from? Because that would assume a starting point and that time had already existed and it didn't. Now this is, again, I stress, this is nearly impossible for us to wrap our minds around. But it is the truth of our mighty God. He is who He is. And I'm going to step aside and say, are we sure this thing is blowing out cold air? <laughs> Someone might want to check that. Because I think it's just getting hotter. <laughs> but I want to start at that point of the incarnation. I want us to start at that point. Because this is the first and foundational truth of the Incarnation. It comes from God, who was the Creator of the universe. And as such, is separate from it and time and all creation. Within this creation, God placed us, right? Free moral agents fashioned in His image. And He gives them dominion over a planet. A planet particularly special in his creation. Right? We've come to call this planet Earth. We've come to call it home. It's a place where life will dwell and where God especially chooses to display his glory. It will be the center of creation's narrative. Center stage, if you will. However, here's the problem with that. 
these free moral agents sinned against their Creator. They rebelled against the created order, and as such, plunged all of creation into a state of fallenness. To put it quite bluntly, we broke creation. Right? We broke creation. That's why there are wars. That's why there is disease. That's why there is death. We broke creation. Now, skipping thousands of years of human's history to cut to the chase, the Creator then came into His own creation. He then came into His own universe. He who was separate from time entered into time. He who was separate from time entered into time. Right? He who was beyond the physical then became flesh so that He might save creation and save those who were in active rebellion of Him. One of the clearest statements in all of the Bible of that is this. In 1 Timothy 1.15, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Right? That's a pretty clear and concise way of saying everything that I've been trying to say. In fact, if you don't take anything away from this morning, we got a lot of distractions this morning. If you don't take anything away from this morning except this, I pray this will be what you take away. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Right? We fell and broke creation. So the Creator entered His own creation by becoming the created in order to save us. In other words, the painter who was separate from the canvas painted himself into the canvas. Into his own painting. But Luke gives us more. Right? He doesn't stop there. He doesn't merely tell us that the incarnation comes from God. That it is the eternal God taking on flesh and entering creation. But he also tells us how he accomplishes it. And who results. So how does God do it? Well, the first clue Luke gives us about how does the Creator become the created, the first thing you must do is you, make, must, you must make the impossible possible. That's the first thing you must do. You must make the impossible possible. Verse 37 reads, For nothing will be impossible with God. For nothing will be impossible with God. That seems like a cheap answer, <laughs> doesn't it? How does the Creator become the created? It's impossible, but God, could, it seems like a, like a cheat way out, right? But doing the impossible, duh. It's not very satisfying. Yet, this is the explanation Gabriel gives Mary for how God can become man in the womb of a virgin. It's impossible. And I'm feeling cold air coming out, so the impossible can't happen. Thank you, brother, for fixing that. I appreciate that. I think you did something. It's the best I've felt since I've got here. So the impossible can happen. This is the answer that the angel gives Mary. Remember, we are talking about the same God who spoke the entire universe into existence using just His words. Right? Everything we see, every atom in orbit around its nucleus, Every star in the sky that you walk out at night and you see that is billions of light years away and a hundred times bigger than our own sun, which alone could bake us in a second if God ever stayed His hand, ever moved His hand. It's the same God. So the impossible becoming possible. Do we not think that this same God who spoke the stars into existence using just His words could change the laws of physics and biology and chemistry and anatomy which he wrote if he so wanted. Surely the impossible is possible with God. He stopped the earth from spinning for Joshua so the sun would stand still in the sky and Israel could win a battle. And he did it without causing astronomical failure. Gravity still worked. Everything still worked. The solar system was held in stay. The same God also parted the Red Sea. Right? He literally rewrote the laws of gravity to allow water to define the earth and rise up, not down, and rewrote the laws of precipitation to allow the seafloor to reverse precipitate so that it would dry up and the Israelites could walk across it. All this, and it kills me, you have modern, quote, Bible scholars 
and they'll, they'll say it wasn't. They'll come to the global flood, and they'll say, well, it wasn't a global flood. Surely the same God who wrote the laws of physics and meteorology could write them a second if he wills. If God could create the earth, if we believe God could create the earth, do we not believe he could flood it? If God could write the laws of gravity to fill the Red Sea, could he not write them differently for a time to part it? If God could write creation and order the solar system so that the earth revolves on its axis every 23 hours and 56 minutes, could he not rewrite them differently for a, will, for, for a while, if you will? I, I love it. We have people who give their entire lives to trying to find, to, to, to this playing out physics, watching it play out and untangle it. And, and it's a beautiful, honorable, and noble science. You're literally... You're, we're, we're investigating the beauty of God's creation and what makes it tick. I have an aunt who is infinitely smarter than me, my, my dad's sister, Dr. Denton, and she has given her life to the science. She's infinitely She had to tutor me just so I didn't fail in high school. Shows where I'm at on this. She has earned her Ph.D., and multiple other graduate degrees. She's participated in groundbreaking experiences, experiments, and she's made several discoveries. She's had her research published. You can read it. She's a department chair for a college back in Illinois, and yet she's given her life to physics, and yet God could rewrite that entire science that people like my aunt have given their entire lives to studying. God could rewrite it in a moment. In a moment. In one moment, God could simply will it and rewrite the laws of physics in an entirely new way and make our entire physics textbooks look like children's scratch. How big is our God? Listen to the testimonies. Genesis 18, 14. Is anything too hard for the Lord? Job 42, 2. I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Jeremiah 32, 17, Ah, Lord God, it is you who has made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. And then here, the angel Gabriel tells Mary, Nothing will be impossible with God. And the time has come for the impossible thing to be done. The time has done to make the impossible possible. God will enter his creation. He will enter physics. He will enter astronomy. He will enter his sciences. He will enter these things as a part of it all without ceasing to be the uncreated God. The creator becomes the created while remaining uncreated. This is impossible. This is mind-blowing. I don't expect us to wrap our minds around it. The angel knows it. <laughs> the angel knows it too. No punches are pulled here in this narrative. What impossibility will God do to impossibly break into his creation? What laws of physics and biology and anatomy will God rewrite for this? In verses 26 and 27, Luke says, In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man named Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. Skip down. Oh, I'm going to read one more verse. Skip down to verse 31. And it says, now listen, this is what she, we, the angel is telling the Virgin Mary now. Now listen, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. So how does God do the impossible? God impossibly breaks into the universe through the womb of a virgin. So the impossibility of this impossibility just keeps getting more impossible. <laughs> right? This is not written for easy believerism, to be sure. Right? If Christianity was meant to be a hoax for people just to come believe in, this wouldn't be here. This wouldn't be here. It's not the most logical way that a human would think this through. People don't just believe this sort of thing. Right? And the impossibility of this is not lost on Mary either. For she says in verse 34, Mary asked the angel, How can this be since I have not had sexual relations with a man? So it's, the impossibility of this is lost on no one in this narrative. The angel knows it. Mary knows it. Everyone knows it. A quick side note. I love this. This is beautiful language on, on Mary's, Mary's part. How many engaged people can say this today? I'm only betrothed to so-and-so. I'm only engaged. Of course I haven't had sex with them. That's for marriage. Mary states this so matter-of-factly. 
I just want to, I just want to recognize before we move on, this is a beautiful, God-honoring statement. And I'm afraid it all too often gets overshadowed by all the divine stuff happening here. But, but people, please don't miss this. We need to be able to say this. Young people, my peers, we need to be able to say this. Mary notes the impossibility of this pregnancy because she is not married. Therefore, she has not had sexual relations with a man. That's what makes it so impossible. Therefore, she is both concerned and confused. How can this be? The impossibility of God breaking into creation now revealed to happen through the womb of a virgin. This is not lost on anyone in this scene. Why would God choose to do it in this manner? The short answer is this. The short answer is this. It was necessary for our salvation. The long answer, which of course you're going to get, has to do with how original sin... I love you, but that's my job, right? The long answer has to do with how original sin is imputed and us needing a Savior who is both fully man, yet free from sin, and also fully God. That's the long answer. Most Bible scholars believe, and I agree, that Adam's sin, original sin, is imputed paternally through the Father. This is taken from places like Deuteronomy 5.9. I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, bringing the consequences of their father's iniquity on the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. And other similar passages. Also in Genesis 3, where it was, in Genesis 3, we see it was Eve who first ate the forbidden fruit and gave it to Adam. But it was Adam who was held responsible, not his wife. Genesis 3.6. The woman saw that the tree was good for food and delightful to look at, and that it was desirable for obtaining wisdom. So she took some of its fruit and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Skip down to when God confronts them in verse 9. So the Lord called out to the man and said to him, Where are you? There is this sense that original sin is imputed paternally through the dad, right? Through the, because he's the, the head of the family in that sense, so there's an accountability there. Naturally, this means every person born of man will inherit Adam's original sin, which is all of us, right? Because I'm assuming everybody in this building has a dad. Probably, it's a pretty safe bet. This is why Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, for an Adam all die. He doesn't say for an Eve all die. He says for an Adam all die. Indeed, this is why all die. Because we can trace, right, paternally, do the genealogy, all, our bloodlines, all the way back to our first father, Adam. And like our fathers before us, and Adam before all of them, just like our fathers and just like our first father, Adam, all of us are prone to wander, prone to sin. And the wages for sin is death. Romans 3.23, so in Adam I'll die. Now this presents a problem. This presents a problem for coming up with a spotless Lamb of God to be the propitiation for our sin. Because since God is just, the propitiation for your sin and my sin must be made by a person. right? Because it was a person who got us into this mess. Yet it must be made by a sinless person. For this person must be worthy to make it. Yet, how can any man born of Adam be sinless, right? There's no one righteous, no, not one. Because we are all born of Adam, and we have all inherited through Adam this sin nature. So if he must be a man, yet a man without sin, we find ourselves in a pickle. They call it a catch-22. What man born of Adam can be just and worthy to make such a sacrifice to earn forgiveness of sins from a righteous and holy God? Here's the fix. The virgin birth, the hypostatic union of Christ, a man who would be fully man, born of a woman, and yet without biological father through whom he could have inherited original sin. He would be a perfect, spotless man. Look, if, if original sin is transmitted paternally, as texts such as Deuteronomy 5.9 and 1 Corinthians 15 sense to indicate, then any lamb of God who must be fully man yet without sin has to be born of a woman, naturally, right, to be human, yet without a male father from whom that original sin would have come from, so God wouldn't impute Adam's guilt to him. 
So instead of a biological father through whom he would have inherited Adam's sin, Jesus came from a heavenly father who knew no sin. So look, the the way that Jesus was sinless and yet man and God was because of the virgin birth. God the Holy Spirit working through a human woman. So in this way, you have a man who was fully man, born of a woman, and yet, who is God, the Son of God. In a sense, God was starting over. Jesus is a second Adam. He has no male head to have inherited in unrighteousness from because his only head was the Father himself. Look, the only other man in all history that can claim, I have no biological father except the heavenly father, the only other man in all history that can claim that was who? Adam. The first man who failed. It would be up to Jesus to set right what Adam screwed up. God was giving humanity a fresh start. A new head. It was up to Jesus to face down where Adam messed up and give us a fresh, clean start. So here's the life of Jesus. Here's how he did with that. As a man, Jesus would grow as you and I grow. He would drink milk from his mother's breast and rely on his mother, Mary, for nourishment and provision. He would experience growing pains, puberty, and all the things that young men experience. Even the temptations. He would weep. When his friend Lazarus died, he would experience genuine hunger and thirst in the desert. He would experience exhaustion after healing the masses and need to sleep on the boat. He would bleed. He would bruise. He would die. He would experience all of the consequences common to fallen humanity, yet unrightly so, because he himself was without actual sin. Because, as God, He was the bread of life, and his food was to do the will of his Father. As temptations arose, while he laboriously bore each and every single one of them, he never succumbed to them. When his friend Lazarus died, he raised him from the dead. After waking from his nap in the boat, he then sovereignly calms the wind and the waves, telling them to be still. And after his blood ran out and his heart stopped beating, he raised himself from the dead. This is why the hypostatic union of God and man was necessary. It was necessary for your salvation and to correct and restore all righteousness. What man born of Adam can be just and worthy to earn forgiveness of sins from a righteous and holy God? One who is still fully man and yet fully God without spot or blemish. Tempted and tried as we are, one who is no stranger to death and yet is without sin in every way. And to do this, God chose to be conceived into the womb of a virgin. He is the Son of God, the Word made flesh. This is the only way our sins could be forgiven. This is the only way you and I could be restored to the Father. We needed a Savior who could experience all of your temptations, to experience the same temptations that are common to you and that Adam did, and yet stare them down and overcame them where you and I fell to them. Who could die our death and suffer the consequences of our death and then take the sting out of it. We needed a man who could rise in our place. A man who was separate from space and time, yet incarnated into it so he could experience an eternal damnation worth of punishment for sins in three days of our time so that to Jesus, whom a day is like a thousand years, would experience an infinite punishment for our transgressions against the Father and forgive them in full. An eternity in hell, beloved, has been served in full in the place of those who would come to believe in Christ. Our term, our prison sentence, has been served. In three days' time, Jesus bore the infinite wrath of God for our infinite transgressions against Him, displaying the infinite love and forgiveness of the infinite Father. You can't do that. I can't do that. It's only Jesus. 
Acts 4.12 says, There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. It's only Jesus, the Son of God, the very Word made flesh, God broken into creation through the womb of a virgin to save sinners. This is why it is troubling, that, it's so troubling that many, there's a lot of progressive churches today that don't teach the virgin birth. This is very troubling because if you take this away, you have assaulted the hypostatic union of Christ, the overwhelming of the Holy Spirit on the Virgin Mary, and begetting a son who is biologically of Mary, a son of man, and yet is divinely a son of God, and as such is the eternal, uncreated one becoming created. As far as I'm concerned, if you take that away, you, you take away the virgin birth, you don't have Christianity anymore. You, you can put whatever you want on the church sign. You can call yourself Baptist, you can call yourself Presbyterian, you can call yourself Methodist, Episcopalian, or even Church of Christ. But if you don't affirm this, you're not Christian. You cannot be part of historic, orthodox Christianity in the true and historic sense if you deny the virgin birth. As far as, I, as, far as I'm concerned, that's the moment other thoughts stop becoming Christianity. It becomes an entirely different religion. Yeah, I'm completely comfortable with this being a litmus by which we measure the authenticity of the faith. I think we can disagree with a lot of stuff and still be Christians and still be brothers and sisters in Christ. We can disagree on, on mode of baptism, on church government, on predestination, on election, on tongues, charismatic gifts, etc. But if you disagree on this, it's no longer Christianity we're debating. It's something else entirely. The angel from God explicitly, I mean, explicitly says, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man named Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And this Mary, from this Mary, would come the hypostatic union of God and man, of God and creation in the person of Jesus. God chose to impossibly defy the laws of biology and anatomy and physics to impossibly break into his creation to save fallen man through the womb of a virgin. This is baseline. This is why we recite the Apostles' Creed every time we take communion. It is to internalize with our minds and confess with our mouths these core foundational truths. So last point, how, how would it come about? How would the impossibility of the virgin birth come about? Well, here's the third thing that Luke tells us. And I'll keep this point short. The third thing Luke tells us in verse 35. We see that God breaking into creation will take the impossible. He will do it through the worm, womb of a virgin. And here's how he will do it. Verse 35, the angel replied to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, you, therefore the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Of God. So God Himself, through His Holy Spirit, with impossibly wonder working power, the power of the Most High will take the place of a human father, and under the shadow of His wing, Mary will become pregnant with the Son of God. Church, this is one of the most important statements that has ever been stated in any book in all history. Right here. This is one of the most important statements. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. In this case, God did not woo, He overwhelmed. And through the womb of Mary, God entered creation and won back creation for Himself, saved us from ourselves. So in review... This is what Luke tells us about how the infinite and absolute God, the creator of the universe, broke into his own creation. He broke in, one, by doing the impossible. Secondly, by choosing to do it through virgin birth. And thirdly, by accomplishing this, by sending his Holy Spirit with divine power to impregnate the Virgin Mary with the divine child. So my last brief thing, this is the, the final note. Who, who results from this? Who, if you've got an outline, you can be following me. You can fact check. Right. Who results from this? What does the text say that will result from such an impossible breaking in? Verses 31 and 33. Now listen. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. 
He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Now it's important to note that whenever the text here talks of his father David, that David is functioning as such in legal capacity only, right? Because remember, Joseph isn't his biological father for reasons we've already discussed. However, Jesus will be sitting on the throne of David. God will give him David's throne, so a king will result. Now, of course, God was already king of creation by by virtue of creation, right? As a potter makes clay, so he is free to form it and do with it what he pleases. However, God chose to break into that mold and reign as a king from among us as one of our own, right? Emmanuel, God with us. So quickly, how does this text describe the king? Well, verse 32, he is described as great and the son of the Most High. In verse 31, we are told his name shall be Jesus. Now, Jesus transliterates the Greek Yeshua, which corresponds to the Hebrew name Joshua and means Savior. Savior. His name shall be Savior. And in verse 33, we are told, He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and His kingdom will have no end. So, what kind of king did God break into creation to rule as? What kind of king will break in, back inside of creation to, live, to, to bring us back to live with Him under the warmth, safety, protection, and provision of His sovereign authority? What kind of king? Boil that down. A holy king who will be great. And as the Son of the Most High, named Jesus, our Savior, and whose kingdom will have no end, but go on forever. Now those of us who bleed red, white, and blue and would give our lives for democracy have to admit such a totalitarian kingship maybe doesn't sound so bad, does it, when you describe the king like that? C.S. Lewis once wrote, A great deal of democratic enthusiasm descends from the ideas of people like Rousseau who believed in democracy because they thought mankind so wise and good that everyone deserved a share in the government. The danger of defending democracy on these grounds is that they're not true. I find that they're not true without looking further than myself. I don't deserve a share in governing a hen roost. I share that. Much less a nation. The real reason for democracy is this. Mankind is so fallen that no man can be trusted with unchecked power over his fellows. Aristotle said that some people were fit only to be slaves. I do not contradict him, but I reject slavery because I see no men fit to be masters. However, if there could be a king who is not limited in his wisdom and power and goodness and love for his subjects, then monarchy would be the best of all governments. If such a ruler could ever rise in the world with no weakness, no folly, no sin, who was great and his kingdom would last forever, needing replaced by no one, and the fat and rich days would go on forever, then no wise and humble person would ever want democracy again. Here's the good news, church. There is such a king, and his name is Jesus. He will be great and his kingdom will last forever. He is the Son of God, the very Word of God made flesh, incarnated into creation through the womb of a virgin. As such, he is fully man, yet fully God, as we are, yet without any sin or imperfection. So bringing it full circle, the man in our opening story couldn't become a bird to save it. But God did become a man to save us. When creation was broken, when we fell, the Creator became the created, all while remaining uncreated. And that is what makes the incarnation so glorious. The painter painted himself into the painting. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. What a great, high, and mighty king we serve. Our second Adam, our new head, is God himself. So we're going to rise and celebrate our sovereign God and King who entered his own creation as a flesh and bone babe and sing about this glorious impossibility. Now listen, you will conceive and give birth to a son, Gabriel says to Mary, and you will name him Jesus. 
He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever and his kingdom will have no end. The Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. For nothing will be impossible with God. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So as you rise, as we have our altar call, I want you to know this altar is open. I would be happy to speak with you. If you have not met this king, if you're not yet serving this king, you're outside of his kingdom. Only those in his kingdom get eternal life. The early church didn't say, look what this world is coming to. They said, look what has come into this world. So we're going to rise and let's worship our great and high king. Father, we love you. And we want to thank you as we conclude our time of gathered worship. For after we, Father, had spurned your creation, Father, we had rebelled against your law. We had each gone astray like sheep to our own way. For not leaving us without a God. For not leaving us without a king. But for, Father, for, for chasing us down into creation. For condescending to come among man to walk with us and become one of us so that you may die our death and raise us to life in you. Father, what a glorious truth is your gospel. And Father, I pray for anybody here this morning who may not be living in that kingdom, they may not be living in that truth. Father, there may be intellectual knowledge of it, but there is no heart submission to it. And Father, if that's the case, I pray by your Holy Spirit that you would just bring it about in their life. Bring them to a place of submission to your holy kingship. Our sovereign God on David's throne who will ruin, reign forever. Father, we praise you. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for your mercy. And sinners like ourselves. And as we go throughout this Christmas week, Father, help us to never forget it. Help us to be ever evident in our hearts and remember the reason for the season is the painter entering the painting. And if you would all please pray with me the Lord's model prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. Aren't you glad it cooled off in here? Yes. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Hey, listen, I love you guys. This Wednesday at 7 is going to be a very special service. I really hope you'll come out and celebrate the incarnation with us. It's just going to be a night of hymn singing, of communion. It's going to be a celebratory time. At the end of the night, again, we will have a special guest. So all the babies, all the children, we'll have gifts for all of them. Uh, love you guys. Let's close with the, with the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Go this week and walk with Christ. <laughs>